Hi everyone, my name is Prachi Shivgaukar. I'm a climate advocate from India and I'm the founder of Cool the Globe, a citizen-led app for climate action. Humanity's use of fossil fuels is severely damaging our environment. To combat this, the world's nations must find energy alternatives or technologies that can eliminate fossil fuels. The challenges faced to replace fossil fuels with renewable energies range from political pressures to supply and demand cost. How do we solve these problems? Dr. Sram Frankhauser is a professor of climate change economics and policy at the University of Oxford, where he's affiliated with the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment. He's also research director of Oxford Net Zero and a fellow of Dubin College. Before joining Oxford, he was director of the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and Environment at the London School of Economics, where he remains a visiting professor. Uh, I welcome you, Professor Sam. It is my honor to interview you today. Um, so before we start, sir, I want to ask you, how many years have you been working on climate? Yeah, first of all, thanks for the very kind introductions. <laughs> and and it, it's a good it's a good opening question. Uh, and it will be a bit of a giveaway because I have uh, I have worked on climate change in, in sort of various forms, not only in academia, but in, in, in international development and the private sector for since 1990. So that gives you 30 plus years. And since then, you've been at the forefront of tracking where the world is headed um, in terms of reaching net zero emissions. So I want to start by asking you, where are we today? As you look at the UK and other nations around the world facing the net zero challenge, how far are we from reaching the level of sustainable sources of energy needed to replace fossil fuels? How do you think we can solve these challenges? Yeah, in terms of the targets, we are actually not in a bad place. We are in a much better place than we than we were three, four years ago. There has been a real, real acceleration in sort of awareness uh, to climate change and willingness to to you know talk about it and commit to something, which has a lot to do with the sort of things you're doing with the youth movements and the and the pressure from from young people. That's really been transformative, and as a result. Uh, a lot of countries have have committed to net zero target. It's uh, eighty percent of carbon emissions and and almost the same uh, percent of GDP. And people are subject to a net zero target. If all those commitments were implemented, as 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 it says on the tin, word, we would actually be quite you know we would get close. It would give us something just under two degrees warming by by the end of the century. How do you see the most significant storage and timing issues regarding supply availability, including equipment and environmental issues? How do we solve this challenge? Yeah, I mean, that's really where, you know, where the rubber hits the road. It is, is, it is in the nitty gritty of things and it's in the technical complexities of things. And it's in the technical complexities of everything, pretty much everything, probably not quite everything, but most of economic activity that 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 we're engaged in somehow at one level has to has to change and a lot of it of that change will start with uh, with clean electricity uh, we will use if we clean up electricity supply and and in, enhance electricity supply there's still lots of uh, people who don't have access to clean electricity uh, and if we enhance that supply we can use clean electricity then to clean up some of the other sectors that we need to clean up. So a lot of it hinges on, on that uh, electricity uh, decarbonization. We've reached a tipping point, I believe, that uh, that renewable energy sources are now the all but the default when people think about investing in electricity. Uh, the, the most obvious things in practically all contexts is renewables. A building set up a meeting uh, a few months ago and they said that switching to solar is um, more cost effective for us in the long run. And that meant that everybody in the building was on board with this plan. So I think uh, at the end of the day, many times it just boils down to uh, the cost effectiveness. So what, according to you, are some of the uh, some of the challenges in terms of uh, in terms of the financials? Uh, you know, what about the already existing financial investment, which may prove to be a challenge? Yeah, finance is hugely important for, for, for the net zero transition. And the reason is, for, for the reasons you've given, um, 
we need we need a lot of investment. Um, people have measured, you know, just changing the entire capital stock of the world, all the power grids and the, the transport infrastructure and everything we have, plus the amount that we are building for development reasons. Uh, if you if you sort of have to switch all that to to clean as we have to, that sort of that's measured in trillions of dollars uh, a year of investment that we need. So we have to redirect financial flows. Uh, financial flows are measured in trillions of dollars as well. So it's not a problem in that sense. But you have to redirect financial flows from conventional to green. Nuclear energy. What do you see as the impediments to expanding this as a source? And how do you think we can tackle the issues? Where, where I am now is we, we can't afford to throw away solutions. Climate change is so urgent, uh, so important that we have to throw everything at the problem we have. We can't afford to, you know, cancel out certain 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 solutions are so bad that we can't, but uh, cancel them out. But we we have to throw a portfolio of, of things at the problem. So nuclear for me is part of the mix. Why is it difficult to do beyond people's attitude to it? That's sort of mostly a financial issue. Nuclear power stations are big complex, expensive things to build. There's a lot of money that is committed up front. Uh, uh, and, and that's quite hard to pull off. And in a world where renewable energy is getting cheaper and cheaper, nuclear, you know, starts to sort of lose out a little bit economically. Uh, and one of the solutions is to make these things smaller and modular and so have small scale reactors that that might be one way of, of bringing nuclear back. My final question to you, Professor, what are your key tips on how the world can pull this off together to meet its climate goals? And how could youth climate activists like me facilitate this process? I mean, it's, it's the, that for me is sort of one, as I started off the, this conversation, one of the most sort of beautiful, rewarding trends of the last two, three years is uh, young people taking charge of this agenda and really shaping it and changing it. And it's sort of unbelievably powerful. You know, you know, as I said, I've done climate change for 30 years and we sort of wondered for 27 or 28 of those 30 years, how on earth does one get that message across? And, and young people have got that message across. It's been powerful, um, partly because you, you sort of represent the future generation, you, you give voice to the future generation, and partly for purely practical reasons like most parents listen to their children. Uh, so you have that, you know, you have that leverage over over decision making. Just make good use of it. Make extensive use of it. Thank you so much for sharing your time and perspective today with us, Professor Frank Hauser. This is Prachi Shivgaukar. I add my voice to the voices of my net zero international youth peers to monitor the action of our world leaders to achieve their net zero commitments. Together, we can achieve net zero. <laughs>